Thank you. Thank you, Liliana. Thank you for inviting me. Mm -hmm. That's a good time. Yeah. Thank you. And, okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Liliana, thank you to the whole school and thank you, Alexander, all of you for your excellent scholarship and arrangements. Um, it's been a pleasure to be here and I've learned a lot. Um, uh, if we uh, speed through some of the images of the space in which we're swimming, or in which most of the world is swimming, the retinal afterglow is of a soupy matrix of details and repeatable formulas that make most of the space in the world. Buildings that we typically think of as singularly crafted geometrical formal objects are often reproducible products, we call what I've called spatial products, that proliferate globally. It's the familiar confetti of of uh, brightly colored boxes that are nestled in black asphalt or bright green grass, all telling elaborate stories about Arnold Palmer golf or um, beard papa cream puffs or Starbucks coffee. And it's the same in Milwaukee, or this image is from Inner Mongolia. Now, not only buildings, but entire cities have become mobile monetized technologies, almost infrastructural technologies. Um, we no longer build cities by accumulating masterpiece buildings. Um, architecture makes some beautiful stones in the water, but the world is making the water. It's not an infrastructure of pipes and wires that are hidden in the ground, but a, a, a kind of cartoon uh, of abstract technical and economic logics that again, far from hidden, is pressed into view. And typically, the, when we build cities according to formulas, we're usually uh, replicating formulas for the Shenzhens and Dubais everywhere in the world with the kind of drumbeat of generic skyscrapers. So again, infrastructural technologies are then not only the the urban substructure, but the urban structure itself. Space is itself a technology and a carrier of information. And we're perhaps less accustomed to the idea of space as a, as a technology or as a medium of information like, like mobile telephony or computing. And the information is not object or text, and it's not carried on wires or microwaves. It's, it's, in, it's carried in invisible, powerful activity that determines how objects and content will be organized and circulated. The technologies of this infrastructure space have the power and currency of not text, but software, like an operating system for shaping the city. Not content, but kind of content manager, an operating system. So like an operating system, this infrastructure space makes certain things possible and certain things impossible. It's, it's, again, it's not the declared content, but like the operating system, it's the managing, it's the manager of that content, dictating the rules of the game in this urban milieu. It's, and it's an updating platform, unfolding in time to handle new circumstances, to encode the relationships between buildings, to dictate logics, so while we typically don't think of space as having agency, this infrastructure space is doing something. Again, making certain things possible and certain things impossible. So there are object forms there, like, <coughs> like buildings, but also active forms, like bits of code in the software that organize the building information. Um, and that information resides often in uh, the undeclared activities of this software, the protocols, the routines, the schedules, the choices that are manifest in space. If we were to borrow McLuhan's meme transposed to infrastructure space, you could almost say the action is the form. 
And this infrastructure space is the secret weapon of some of the most powerful people on Earth. And it is precisely that because it can orchestrate activities that can often remain undeclared, but nevertheless consequential. And some of the most radical changes to the globalizing world, pretty easy to say this, the most radical changes to the globalizing world are being written not in the language of law, international law sort of doesn't exist, uh, or diplomacy, um, but it's being written in the spatial technologies of this, what we could call infrastructure space. There are political promotions and persuasions that can be foregrounded as content, uh, sometimes to disguise or distract from what the organization is actually doing. There are plenty of declared utopias uh, that are floating over this undeclared medium of activity. Uh, and there is no real, that is a supposed antidote, to those multiple fictions. This matrix space generates de facto forms of polity faster than even quasi-official forms of governance can legislate it. The world's spatial products um, organize undeclared activities that are even capable of outpacing law. And these massive global infrastructure systems administered by mixtures of public and private actors and often driven by profound irrationality uh, form an extra statecraft, what I've been calling an extra statecraft that's wilder than any of the familiar leviathans for which we have some kind of uh, rehearsed, well-rehearsed political response. And what I mean by extra statecraft, that portmanteau, means something outside of but, but in addition to, in partnership with the state. So we need, we need evidence of this infrastructure space, um, this infrastructural operating system, but we also need to know how to hack into it, how to juggle the multiple utopias and the fluid realities. And right now, the, the, uh, this operating system is uh, controlled by experienced economies, uh, financial industry quants, 28-year-old McKinsey consultants, yes men from the World Bank, um, and it's discussed in technical terms of informatics and economics, where space, however durable and uh, ecstatically elaborate, is just a, a byproduct of those, of that kind of uh, econometric uh, operating system. No one's really leading with, no one's hacking with spatial variables. It would be pretty easy for us as architects to focus on the object forms, um, you know, to, to make another stone in the water. And, and it's a reasonable artistic choice. It's a good artistic choice. Um, when we're also pretty good at the kind of uh, sci-fi dystopic scripts, at the political arias, at tragic end games. Uh, redemptive utopias that we can ladle into the already ecstatic scripts that are in play here. We're really good at all those defaults. Um, but what if, what if one has an artistic curiosity not only about the stone in the water, the object form, but the water itself? W what if the world could use from us? What if we happen to be good at it? What if, what if the world could use from us Form making in another register or another gear, forms with the power and currency of software, um, active forms that have a chance of hacking into the operating system, hacking into this flow of information and activities in space. And how, how does one begin to look for those active forms, for markers, for little bits of code in the operating system? Um, how does one design interdependencies between these forms that are like software, or little machines of, that produce space? Forgive me for this little bit of Americana, but uh, it's, it's apt somehow. Mark Twain, I'm sorry, uh, uh, you know, he was once a steamboat captain on the Mississippi, um, Samuel Clemens. Um, and he, he talked about the way in which um, he would be reading the surface of the water, all the little dimples and ripples that were on the surface of the water, and he likened it to reading a, a, a sort of wild adventure novel 
uh, all the all the passengers were looking at sort of landscape pictures. You know, they were seeing like pretty framed landscape pictures. Well, uh, and they were reading a kind of happy little story. He and he was reading he was reading the the sort of dangerous story, uh, dangerous markers on the surface of the water that 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 told that marked possible uh, you know currents and, uh, and turbulence underneath. Really, he was reading what, what we could only be called call the disposition of the water, where the disposition is the sort of character or propensity of all those activities uh, in, in the water. And, and I wonder if we can do that um, with this kind of operating system in the world. You know, work, work with the medium, not the message. Work not with the pattern that's printed on the fabric, but the way the fabric floats. Uh, not the shape of the game piece, but the way it plays. Not the field, but the, but the delta, the way the field is changing. Not the text, but the constantly updating software that's managing that text. Not the object form, but the active form. These activities or, or active forms, again, like little bits of code in the operating system, can also be decoupled from rhetoric. And, and, and utopian or, or otherwise, uh, and can confound any designation of a determinate real. Um, because they're only signs of an ongoing process, a kind of diagnostic in the fluid politics of extra statecraft. Just, just like the ripples and dimples of river navigation, the practicality of these forms relies on their indeterminacy. It makes sense, you know. You, you, it, it, you have to expect that they will remain indeterminate. That you, that you won't be able to declare anything. And that's the most practical position to take. Um, so I want, I want to plunge back into some evidence of this operating system. But, but if you will indulge me, just two minutes of, of thinking and contemplating about how, do you, how would you actually hack into this? Um, you know, would, would, are we any? Are we as architects, with what our skills that we have, would we be any good at this? Would we be any better than the 28-year-old McKinsey consultant? Um, I mean, we don't. We don't usually treat spaces and urban organizations as actors. We treat them as collections of objects or volumes, and we might assign agency only to the moving cars or to the electrical current or to the inhabitants. Um, in another default. Um, you know, we might only treat this as having some kind of uh, relevance in the world if we could turn it into a giant wiki or if it could be uh, coded with sensors or drones and then we could all give TED talks about it. But um, we're less accustomed to the idea that space, rather than code or text, can be a carrier of information, you know, unless it's coded with sensors or information technology. And, and yet, if we can tune our eyes to see that, however static, um, spaces possess agency that resides in relationship and relative position. As Gregory Bateson would say, um, a man, a tree, and an axe is an information system. And we really sort of know it. I mean, we know what the disposition of this organization is. And in this field of nearly identical suburban houses, the infrastructure space is doing something. Um, if the singularly crafted building is the object form, it's this almost agricultural matrix, this, this uh, a sort of agricultural sequencing of events that takes builds 17,000 slabs and 17,000 frames and 17,000 roofs. And there's a declared story here. Maybe it's about home ownership or about Arnold Palmer or about um, uh, early American uh, colonial houses in the US. But the consequential information resides in the undeclared activities of the operating system. And we could design a single house. We could rush up and you know, fix up one of those volumes uh, with objects formed. But it would be more powerful if we could design a multiplier or a contagion, for instance, that used that organization as a carrier. That would start to be a hack, um, uh, something that would change this landscape, almost like the elevator changed urban morphology. We can design a valve. We can design. We can design a multiplier. We can design a valve. We can design a governor. We can design a switch. 
all those things that, that have effects on multiple objects uh, and, and, and making an updating platform for a stream of objects. We can tune uh, network topology. And, you know, in fact, the whole idea of a network topology comes from the Königsberg bridge problem from, from, an, urban, from an urban problem. Um, we can tune the wiring of an organization. Again, having effect on more than one object. Um, we even, we even know something about the political temperament of these dispositions, where they concentrate power or opposition. We know what a broadcast network looks like here. We know what it's serial and parallel. We know, we know uh, how to tune an organization. In fact, we might be some of the best people to understand that. And so one of my favorite examples of a, of a software, uh, of a hack, of a very good hack, is Savannah, Georgia, 18th century American city that Oglethorpe uh, designed uh, for the new world. He, and he didn't design a thing. He didn't design a plat. He designed a software. He designed a set of interdependencies or a growth protocol. So the town would grow by wards. And within each of those wards, there was a relationship between quotients of public and private space. And then every time you uh, also got a ward, you also got a quotient of agricultural space beyond. It was not a thing, but an instruction for relationships between things. It was an active form. You, and you would not know at any moment the shape of the town's outline, even while you had explicit, measured, spatial instructions. You, would have, you had very explicit software, but no object. You had time-release instructions for the ongoing activities of space. So a hack can establish you know, not, not a utopian master plan, but it can release a germ or, or establish some kind of explicit interplay between interdependent agents. It can make a, a little engine of variables, like, like, like the diagram that Deleuze and Guattari describe, or the dispositif that, that Foucault described. This is not, in some ways, a challenge to the magic we already, and the skills we already do, but released into an extended territory. To, to borrow from um, ordinary language philosopher Gilbert Ryle, it's, it's not like either a discussion of utopia or realism. Uh, if either of those involve knowing that, um, it's about n not knowing that, but about knowing how. So if we, if we plunge back into evidence, which is what I want to show you, of, of um, Of all the spatial softwares that are currently uh, circulating around the world, there's a dominant one. And it's called the Free Zone. It's the infrastructural technology that we now use to make cities. And the promotional videos are all the same. There's a zoom from outer space that locates a point on the globe that's supposed to be the center of the Earth. And graphics indicate flying times, demonstrating that it's uh, 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 Near to, near to every every part of the globe, and then there's a deep movie trailer voice that that lists all the requisite features, and there's stirring dynasty music that accompanies the sweep through uh, cartoon skylines and resorts and suburbs and sun flares, and and this software is a, a relatively dumb enclave form. It produces suboptimal suboptimal economic results. And no one even really knows why we use it, except that we use it. Um, and because it delivers incentivized urbanism that the world has become addicted to. It's the most popular world city paradigm. But as a software, it's more primitive than MS-DOS. The wild mutations of the form, if we look at it over its long history, has a longer history. but the wild mutations of the form over the last 30 years um, make the form look insanely penetrable in a kind of hopeful way, actually. So it has ancient roots in free ports and um, uh, pirate enclaves. But the zone mutated in the early 20th century uh, from a warehouse compound that stored uh, custom free trade to a mid-century UN uh, UNIDO promoted uh, export processing zone 
uh, to a formula for jump-starting the economies of development, developing countries. Um, and in that EPZ um, incarnation, uh, they started uh, developing, uh, letting the zone operate under authorities in independent from domestic laws of the host country. So the zone typically provides special infrastructures, uh, uh, tax incentives, foreign ownership of property, streamlined customs, cheap labor, deregulation of labor, uh, and environmental law. Um, so it means that you can, you can bypass the, the laws of the host country. And while it remained in the backstage and was really regarded as something that was kind of a suboptimal instrument, once China had adopted it, um, it began to grow exponentially. Um, um, that's a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. And every program from um, business, residential, cultural, resort wanted to locate in the zone. Why wouldn't they? Uh, to sort of enjoy this uh, lubricated political quarantine. So, in a sense, the zone swallows the city whole. It was assumed that it would just kind of reabsorb into the national fabric, but it did the opposite. It, 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 it brought more things into its boundary. And it's now taken the center stage as the, as the germ of a city building epidemic that, that's, that's the, the formula for repro the software, if you will, for reproducing Dubai and Singapore and Hong Kong all around the world. So the zone that used to look like this, or this, or this, now looks like that, or that, or that. And while in the 1960s there were a handful of zones around the world, today there are thousands, some measured in hectares, some measured in square kilometers. The zone is the nexus of every global technology, the, um, the one-stop shop, you know, the, the, the site of headquartering for all the global players. And in some ways, it's, it's become a self-fulfilling prophecy, a, um, um, a self-perpetuating agent for the growth of extra-state territory. It's still, in its sweatshops and dormitories, still um, a site of labor abuse, really grisly labor abuse. Um, zones maintain autonomous control over a closed loop of, of activities, so they, they can maintain a kind of special stupidity, a kind of, a kind of uh, isomorphism, an isomorphic disposition. They've naturalized the form of lawlessness. And now major cities, uh, even national capitals, which are supposedly the center of law, have created their own zone doppelgangers so that they have, they have they're the state and they have their own kind of shadow state agent that they can use as, as proxy or camouflage. This is a New Songdo City, which is a kind of double of Seoul in the Incheon Free Trade Zone, what its developer Stanley Gale calls City in a Box. He wants to make more of them. It's based on New York, Venice, and Sydney, so it has a, a Central Park, a Canal Street, a World Trade Tower, etc golf course, um, and again, sort of surpassing irony, Astana is a free zone that's a newly minted capital as free zone. So the, what is supposed to be the center of law, the capital, is now uh, moved from Almaty to Astana as part of President Nazarbayev's um, kind of paleo Genghis competition with Dubai. So for all of its efforts to be apolitical, the zone is in the crosshairs of global conflict, and while extolled as an as a instrument of economic liberalism, uh, the zone trades state bureaucracy for even more complex layers of extra state governance and market manipulation and regulation. Um, there's connections to some of the uh, ideas about some of the flip-flopping and oscillations of libertarian scripts that we've heard before today. For all its intentions to be a tool of economic and uh, uh, logistical rationalization, it's become a perfect crucible of irrationality, ruled with the silly uh, patois of management ease. And it's also a kind of strange intentional community with, with palaces and resorts where petrodollars can get away to relax. This is quiche. So given the zone's ambition to be a city, maybe it already carries, how do you hack this, right? 
g g given his own ambition to be a city, maybe it, maybe it already carries some of the genetics of its own reversal, its own anecdote. One way to hack the zone in incentives um, is to um, uh, is to is to map the incentives back onto the existing city rather than into ex-urban enclaves. It's a simple, dumb idea, but there it is. If that idea were contagious around the world, there'd be a huge, huge shift. Um, as if changing from serial to parallel computing, as if swapping out the topology or the wiring of the zone um, to put selective incentives, not uh, in, in, to put them in Guadalajara or Moscow or, or Quito instead of places outside of those cities. Return the zone also then to the rule of law. And then finally maybe directly return the financial benefits to the domestic economy. Get interdependencies to uh, build up between incentives and um, uh, and incentives for the for the city. It's a simple idea, but it don't, it becomes a powerful position if it's seen as, as a multiplier. If it's seen as a hack within a population of zones, it's the difference between designing a master plan and a contagion. The difference between knowing that and knowing how. We can drop down to another. A huge shift in, in global infrastructure space if we were to uh, go to East Africa, uh, specifically Kenya, the last place on earth to receive international fiber optic uh, cable and one of the places is poised to experience uh, some of the most explosive telecommunications growth. So East Africa used to look like this in terms of its fiber optic um, cable, now it looks like this. Now it has three international submarine Cables, it's flush with broadband, serves dense populations of cell phones, and these are the kinds of ads, these are the images of the kind of ads that one sees, right, that the world is turned upside down, and in 2000, you know, the world had 750 million cell phone subscriptions. In 2013, it's 6.8 billion, and three quarters of those are in the developing world. Um, so, and mobile phones are the largest shared platform, according to the World Bank, except that what we might say is that space is the largest shared uh, technology. And any urbanist worth their salt would know about the relationship between a highway and a railroad and a city, but we're under-rehearsed in the spatial consequences of broadband and mobile telephony, even though in, in some ways the cell phone is like a new elevator in terms of its spatial impact in terms of the way it changes um, everything, villages, roads, cities. Crucial choke points exist between the kind of linear disposition of fiber, which is buried in the ground and it territorializes not unlike a like railroad or a highway. Um, there's that disposition and then there's a kind of atomized disposition of microwaves and handsets and then the switches and choke points in between. Spatial impact for all of those. In Kenya, there's lots of, lots of economists, lots of 28-year-old McKinsey consultants and bankers on the ground there. Uh, but the development expertise is spoken in the language of business and technology, again, informatics and econometrics, um, um, all trying to predict the impact of development 2.0 in there sort of horrible jargon. Um, and there's plenty of entrepreneurs writing software for billions of cell phones, like M-Pesa, which is now the way most of the world does their, their banking. The entrepreneurs know how to use a cell phone as a multiplier, as a carrier of new relationships that have economic and, um, and a, an enormous spatial consequence. But the, but, but the space itself, the spatial variables, are treated almost like accidental byproducts of these software. No one's deliberately writing the protocols that start with space in this broadband techno space. In fact, the only thing that is being offered is the kind of outmoded zone. Um, even when broadband capacities mean that you can make an anti-zone. So, for instance, you know they're getting they're getting this. They're getting the you know again the sort of from the stratosphere of promotion. This is for Kanza techno techno city, which is going to look like that. Or that, or what also is considered a good idea is something called Lapset. Uh, it's a transportation corridor between um, 
uh, Lamu on the coast and Juba, the uh, new capital of South Sudan. Um, and here is while Kenya is like finally poised to harness um, some ways to invert expectations about the need for roads, uh, you know, to invert ideas about roads as a symbol of progress, uh, to poise to be able to preserve wilderness and wildlife and for tourism is sort of, it's sad that it's become kind of adopted this old and potentially dangerous development formula around heavy resource extraction. So if the desired outcome in Kenya, Kenya's broadband urbanism, let's say, if the desired result is access, um, you know, a hack, a hack of that would, would consider that, um, you know, Kenya or Nairobi is a, is a prime candidate for, for the zone that's mapped back onto the city instead of the ex-urban enclave. And if it did that, the, if you were to do that, you could begin to build interdependencies, not unlike the interdependencies that you saw in Savannah, um, that would uh, uh, bring more workers to business and then also begin to leverage transit desperately needed in, um, in Nairobi. Um, and there are also there's also a kind of a, 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 a village softwares that one can write that place in interdependence roads and handsets and um, in investment. Dialing up broadband at the same time that you may be dialing down roads and, and preserving uh, landscape. As a way of, again, increasing access not only to the digital information, but to what we can see is this, this, the information of space, the information of the city. Um, populous countries like Africa or are already giving the world all these new business models, new apps. The world is turned upside down, but they might now give the world its its new contagious spatial, most contagious spatial software. Another example of spatial software are are protocols that not only put the development machine into forward, but but ones that put it into reverse. Softwares have the power not only build object forms of urbanism, but use active forms to subtract unnecessary development. In the Amazon rainforest, or um, again, where roads are pretty destructive, or any floodplain in New Orleans or Bangkok, or in McMansion suburbia, um, it's considered to be entirely rational to leave it to the economists running the carbon market or the quants or the financial industry who who bundle properties with some of the most abstracted relationships, even when the result can lead to um, untraceable volatility and, and, and long-term effects on the ground. We can write spatial protocols that link properties in a way that can concentrate, shrink, or subtract development. And I won't go into detail, but just to think about a kind of, you know, savanna in reverse or a reverse game of Go where the object is not making walls, but making clearings. A subtraction protocol that acts like a, a ratchet that links properties, relieves failed properties of their and concentrates density elsewhere. A subtraction protocol, again, might be appropriate in many parts of the world where, where they're sprawling over development or distended or failed markets. Um, it might even be used as somewhat less violent uh, tools of acquisition for informal settlement. But so finally, um, the things that, that make infrastructure space powerful, all these multipliers, whether they're zones or cell phones or special products, its irrational fictions or its undeclared but consequential activities are maybe the very things that, that make it immune to, to righteous declaration um, uh, and prescription, both of which, I suppose we could say, accompany the programs of utopia and realism in all of their various incarnations that we've heard about today. The, the rational, resolute, righteous, while cornerstones of dissent are sometimes less consequential in this world than, than the discrepant, the fictional, or the sly. 
Infrastructure space tutors a shrewder, cagier counter to the lubricated agility of global power, a kind of alternative extra state craft. We know there are some forms of, of activism that demand declaration, where there are strongly held forthright beliefs that galvanize a fight for solidarity and decency and justice, and that activists fight and die for these principles using techniques that have at certain junctures required enormous courage to enact. And, you know, David must kill Goliath. Um, but we also know that, that for many of the powerful players who are behind some of these landscapes, they, they can still survive on fluid, undeclared intentions. This is, this is their medium of undeclared space. It's very easy to toy with and trick dissent if declaration is considered to be the only thing that registers as information. So when targeted, they wander away from the bullseye or switch characters in the story, or come costumed as resistance. So Goliath comes dressed as David, or, or, gets, or tries to sell something to David. And in these situations, dissent is left sort of uh, shaking its fist at an effigy. It, it shows up at the barricade and the, or the border crossing, but the real fight is somehow o over your shoulder, or there's some there's stealthier forms of violence are happening elsewhere. The notion, then the notion that there's a kind of uh, ethical consensus and a, and a proper realm of political <coughs> negotiation even acts as the perfect camouflage for this kind of elusive behavior. And dissent has no choice but to cure its failures with another purification ritual, um, to tighten the content of the story, to make its opponent even more mystical or vaporous, kind of err force of capital or empire or neoliberalism. Um, the world simply wasn't wise enough to recognize the perfection of its utopias or its instrumentalizing of the elementary particles of reality. Still, uh, again, it, any deviation from uh, proper techniques is seen as a, 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 is, is often regarded with uh, uh, contempt um, if one tries to broaden the techniques of activism. And the expectations of proper techniques may ironically supply some of activism's most significant internal constraints. The sense is then inconsolable. Yet the undeclared activities of organization, especially when they're decoupled from a stated script, may be some of the most consequential information. Or at least we have to be able to see it and see how it interacts with the stated uh, information. Um, in infrastructure space, the urban, act the urban activists will have trouble locating this extra information within declaration because it's not there. It's imminent in the active forms that we've been talking about in the softwares um, that we can perhaps recognize best with our skills of measure, space, urbanity, and history. The same active forms that are markers of political disposition are maybe the means to tune and alter, to hack it. Um, um, and these are n no less deliberate, but simply transposed to another gear, from noun to verb, from certainty to uncertainty, from <coughs> prescription to epidemiology, from fix to wager, from knowing that to knowing how, uh, in a way that's, again, t indeterminate to be practical. <laughs> so while there are moments to stand up and give it a name, there are, are um, uh, since there are many powerful regimes that use proxies and doubles, perhaps there's a secret partner to the righteous, to the righteous activist. And that's what I've been thinking about, about being a kind of secret auxiliary to the righteous activist, to softening up the ground for the righteous activist so the righteous activist has a better chance of winning. Binary opposition is sometimes warranted, um, yet maybe there's a way to cheat the cheaters to uh, 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 use the abusers to relieve some of their own abuse. Um, thinking of kind of a sneakier David, you know, a boy you could, you could really love, um, someone who would never go to the trouble of killing uh, the giant, you know, if he could use the giant to, if he could con the giant into doing some work that, uh, that even uh, uses his l large size to amplify the alteration. 
So I've been thinking about it, and I won't go into all of this now, but I've been, but I've been thinking about an expanded repertoire of activism that's learning from infrastructure space that goes beyond declaration to entertain some less transcendent, less automatically oppositional, but sneakier techniques like gossip and rumor and gifts and exaggerated compliance and comedy and remote controls and meaninglessness. Um, a few... Uh, uh, um, uh, techniques that maybe don't have some of the tense resistance of a binary but release us into another territory. You know, pandas that, that offer the sweet arm twisting gift like, like China's gift to Taiwan of two pandas named Unity or uh, in Domination on the Arts of Resistance when James C. Scott provides a wonderful example of exaggerated compliance and a, 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 a portion of Milan Kundera as the joke where the prisoners in the story are supposed to be in a foot race against the guards and so they decide that they're all going to run very slowly like to deliberately lose. Um, there are re multipliers, remote controls, uh, rumors, um, you think about the rumor that was spread, uh, rumors that are always spread by the, by the right in the U.S., like rumors like Obama wasn't born in the United States or something. It's beautifully crafted precisely because it's false, and it works better because it's false, because it's repeated twice as often um, to, to spread the rumor and then to, to correct it. Um, so again, one's not really thinking about the content, but about the active form, the bounce of the rumor the fiction and obfuscation that's related to utopias, realities, or equally good lubricants, misdirection and distraction of hustlers or Chauncey Gardner's comedy uh, is a familiar way of distracting from tension and destabilizing both the self-satisfied critique and the hollow <coughs> consensus. So all these techniques and offer, again, not, not just a tense binary, but maybe release into an, another territory while, um, while the irrationality and invisibility and discrepancy of infrastructure space make it a secret weapon of the powerful. We could say that, you know, two can play at this game, if only to soften up the ground for the true believers so that when we... Look, we, go, we pan back over this infrastructure space. Maybe we see nothing but artistic opportunities with additional kind of pleasure and excess in an art of, of infrastructure space where the action is the form. Voila. <laughs>